Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Women Redeemed webcast brought to you tonight by Kriegel Publications. I'm Dawn Scott Jones. Hey, we are so excited that you've joined us tonight. And not just because we get to share our stories with you, but because we know you have a story too. Psalm 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their stories. And that includes you. So tonight, we're going to be talking about some tough stuff. But I want you to know that you are my friend. This, we hope and pray, will be a safe place for you. So you can share your story with us. We can open up and help each other. And we pray that there will be many more webcasts just like this one. So here's how it's going to work. Tonight, you get the opportunity to meet with three authors, myself being one of them. And uh, we're going to share our stories with you. Tonight, you're going to get a chance throughout the webcast to chat with us, share your questions and your comments, your feelings. And by the way, simply by joining us in the chat, you're going to be eligible tonight to be awarded some great prizes. That's right, we're going to have giveaways all through the night. And by the way, an iPad is going to be one of them. So join us in the chat. And just keep in mind that throughout the webcast tonight, your thoughts and comments and questions can also be shared with the webcast community, those that are listening. So I want to take a moment and introduce to you now one of the authors that is joining us, Kim Katola. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dawn. I appreciate it. And it's just really a blessing to be here tonight with you and with Teske Drake uh, to talk about the book that I've written and um, to hear more about the books that you've both written. My book is Cradle My Heart, Finding God's Love After Abortion. And it's a story of what God has done in my life to help me understand the truth that God can redeem even this, because I didn't believe that for a lot of years after an abortion in my past. So um, as we go tonight, I'll be talking about what the book contains, a little bit about the format, some of how the ministry has evolved in my life and informed uh, my knowledge of scripture, and just sharing the hope that I have through my story and the stories of hundreds of others that I've heard through the years. Hi there, I'm Teske Drake. I'm the mommy to five precious children. I have three babies in heaven and two here on this earth. I'm the wife to Justin, who is my one and only. And I'm also the co-founder and president of Mommies with Hope. Mommies with Hope is a biblically-based support group ministry for women who have experienced miscarriage, stillbirth, or infant loss. I'm the author of Hope for Today, Promises for Tomorrow finding light beyond the shadow of miscarriage or infant loss. And I'm excited to be here with you tonight. I know these are tough issues. These are tough circumstances. And some of us, we're, we're in the trenches. And I want you to know that we're here with you. We're here to share hope and to share God's promises. Hi, I'm Dawn Scott Jones. And I, too, am woman redeemed. I am a conference speaker, a pastor, a consultant, but I'm also a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And that's why I authored the book entitled, When a Woman You Love Has Been Abused. It's a husband's guide to helping a woman overcome childhood molestation. But I'm discovering that women are reading, survivors are reading, husbands, pastors, counselors. Many people are finding help and hope, and I'm so thankful for that. If one out of three women have been sexually abused, and that's the statistic, then when the woman becomes married, she's not just a me, she's a we. And that makes the spouse the second victim of sexual abuse. So I wrote a book to help, to offer hope, to help with understanding. And so we're going to talk more about that tonight. So now that you've had the chance to meet the three of us, Welcome again. We're so glad that you've joined us. And I want to take a moment and introduce to you again the author of Cradle My Heart. She's going to share her story and her journey. Welcome, Kim Katola. Thank you, Dawn. 
And uh, please know that as you're um, weighing in and, and sharing your chat questions, we have moderators also who are working to get the questions to us. And so we do want this to be interactive as well. But I want to start off by telling you um, just a little bit more about my book and why I wrote it and what the themes are um, that God has laid on my heart to share through this work. Cradle My Heart is a result of a ministry that God gave me 10 years ago and at that point I had been on the air in the Minneapolis and St. Paul area as a broadcaster, a radio and television broadcaster for almost 30 years continuously. Um, I, uh, I hosted daily radio broadcasts and I was uh, in television news for a year. Um, I produced radio programs recorded features, I did news, I was a DJ, I was a music director, I, had, I wore a lot of hats. Uh, but the thing that nobody knew about my story was that I had built that career on the choice to abort my first pregnancy when I was 23 years old. And that was something that um, it took me such a very long time to process and to understand. And almost immediately after it happened, I was beset by questions about God. It became a spiritual struggle in my life. And I wondered, did God hate me for this? I wondered about heaven and hell. I wondered about whether or not they had lied to me. Was this really a baby, as my maternal instinct had told me? Or was it just tissue, as they had said when they sold the abortion procedure to me? I wondered about, if it was a baby, what did that mean for the eternal fate of the spirit of that child? I had questions too great for me to fathom. And so I just put those questions away and tried to do the best that I could in life. And, um, you know, I proceeded with the career and God prospered me, but I never had peace. And as God has taken me through this journey of coming to terms with what happened with the loss of that child through abortion, he's also helped me understand that my story is typical in many, many ways, but it's also the case that I think every choice for abortion represents a separate need of the heart. Because of my background in broadcasting, I wanted to be very sure that I was telling the story properly, that I was putting it in its proper context. And I learned that one out of every three American women has experienced abortion or will by the time that she reaches her mid-40s. It's not primarily a teen problem, although one out of every 10 teenagers has been in, impacted by abortion. Uh, most people who choose abortion are single, 84%. Uh, they're in their early 20s, they're using birth control that fails, and the relationship will not last. And all of those things were true of my situation as well. I wasn't really thinking about whether or not it was a moral choice. And that's another reason why I wrote this book, because I think that represents the mindset of many, many women who go into abortion without a lot of reflection about what the conse consequences are really going to be. As God has brought me into the light of his love, I've had the opportunity to talk with many women. As I said, I produced a short feature telling our stories of redemption after abortion. And the stories of other women form the foundation for the book, along with stories of the healing encounters that people had with Jesus Christ. You know, our spiritual ancestors, whose history is written in the Bible, our portraits, they're like our family album to me. And I'm fascinated by the personality of Jesus Christ and his methodology in ministry. And so each chapter is built around one of these healing encounters. And we begin right off the bat with the encounter that Jesus had with the lame man at the pool in John's Gospel. And when he asked him in John 5, 6, do you want to get well? It's an amazing question for the omnipotent Savior of the world to ask somebody who'd been lame for 38 years. If we didn't know better, we might think that Jesus was being sarcastic or somehow cruel with this question. And yet we see that this is how he comes to us, asking us how we feel about our spiritual affliction after the birth. And it's a very useful question for us to ponder. I really want you to start right there tonight, if you've joined this webcast, because there's an abortion in your past. How do you really feel about this spiritually? Are, are you determined in your heart that you will never get over this, that you could never tell the truth to others? Are you determined in your heart that you will not think about it, and so you know that you have other things that are serving as crutches in your spiritual lameness, addictions and promiscuous behavior, eating disorders, all sorts of 
um, mental health and spiritual problems can follow after abortion. But if we want to get well, Jesus simply said to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. I'm amazed by that story. And it parallels a story that I tell in the book of a woman that I've named Sheila. Sheila was in the abortion procedure when she learned that she had twins. She thought she was aborting one child, but she later found out while the abortion was underway that there were twins. And her guilt began immediately. She said she had no intention of ending the life of two children. And it took her many long years to understand the truth of Romans 8.1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, even if we feel we have sinned doubly by having more than one abortion or even aborting twins when we weren't aware that we were even carrying twins. My story involves the loss of a child, as I said, at age 23. I don't have multiple abortions in my past, but half of all of the repeat procedures that have occurred of the 55 million abortions that have happened in America since legalization in the 1970s, over half of those are repeat procedures. So forgiving ourselves for doing that more than once has become a very important important part of the ministry. Not forgiving ourselves, I should be very careful how I say that. Understanding God's mercy and grace, even to those who have had more than one abortion, is an important part of the ministry. And so I go through the healing miracles of Christ. We uh, see Jesus talking to the woman at the well, and imagine that um, Jesus is meeting you as you're going about your chores today. And he sees you buying, let's say, a 24-pack of water and says to you in the line next to you at the checkout counter, may I have a bottle of water? You know, what would you say? Would you be like the woman at the well who would enter into a conversation with him about your thirst? Um, this has been very important for women who feel that they were deceived when they made the choice for abortion. So we see some of their stories. Um, the bleeding woman who reached out for the hem of his robe, I think models for us that shame because of who we are within the abortion experience is also within the healing mercy of Christ. And as I've talked with African American women in particular who feel targeted for abortion because of their race, um, I have found that, that there's a special need for healing there. The, the anger and the rage that goes along with accepting the truth of this, that there has been racial targeting and racial profiling in abortion, um, has been something that Danielle's story, I think, will really bring to light. If you're joining us tonight and you're a person, uh, a woman who is um, African American or Latina, uh, perhaps you're aware of this. Maybe you've been reading the news coverage. Maybe you've had a sense that there's a disproportionate number of your friends and family members impacted by this issue. And I want to help with that. I want to help with that as well. And so, and so it goes through the 10 chapters of the book. Uh, each story displaying something very, very different. Uh, I was not subject to domestic violence or coercion, but many women are. I try to tell that story in the book. Um, I can't know the circumstances of the choice that you made or the choices to end a child's life through abortion, but I can promise you that I know the one who knows every detail of what has happened in your story. And, and if you've not yet experienced his healing mercy, I hope that you'll begin to connect with it tonight through the love and the power of Jesus Christ to redeem us. So I'm, I want to, uh, and I want to also say that as we've been conceiving this webcast, and thinking about what is the common thread between the issues that we're addressing in our books and in this conversation tonight, abortion and miscarriage and abuse seem to maybe not be as connected as, as we might think uh, on the face of it. But one of the common threads is that we've all experienced loss. We have, in my case, to, have, to resolve the issues of guilt and grief, um, and in the case of miscarriage, as Teske Drake is going to share with us, um, the losses, especially with multiple losses after miscarriage, um, we need the redemption that comes as we understand the goodness of God to come into the midst of our circumstances, even, yes, in the midst of uh, heartbreaking loss.
So Teske Drake is now going to share uh, from, from her book. Teske? Thank you, Kim. Well, you may have seen me popping in and out, and so I'm just going to put lay it out there right up front <laughs> that if I pop off, I'll be right back. Um, but I want to start my time with this question. Did you know that God has so many great and precious promises for you? Yes, you, you who are here tonight. And I know that um, for some of you it's been a difficult thing to, um, to maybe face some of these issues and, and to um, admit that this is something that you're struggling with. You know, the world expects us to move on and to get over and to, um, you know, be better. Aren't you better from that now? Um, and so it's hard. And I just applaud you for being here tonight with us. And I want you to know right up front that God has many great and precious promises for you. And as I've um, shared earlier, I have three babies in heaven, two children here on earth. I feel so blessed. And at the same time, it's been a long journey and a hard road. And so I just want to start by sharing a little bit of my story, which begins nearly seven years ago. In fact, um, in November of this year, um, seven, year or seven years ago this November would be when we first found out that we were expecting our second child. We already had a healthy little boy named Gabe. He was four at the time, and we were excited about having another baby. And we didn't wait any amount of time to tell anybody and um, probably told people the day we found out we were pregnant that we were having another child and we were very excited about growing our family and things were going according to my plan I wanted to ha try to have the baby in the summer and I was due July 8th so what better time than that and very quickly I learned that um, God's plans are so much higher than our own and at about 20 weeks along during the pregnancy we received um, some devastating news. We received uh, news that our baby, who we loved so much already, and who um, we were excited to welcome into our family, that she had a condition that was incompatible with life. She had a chromosomal abnormality. We found out we were having a little girl. We already had names picked out, and we chose Chloe for her. And so Chloe had a condition that was incompatible with life. And, you know, let me just say, I detest the words that are used in those situations, incompatible with life and abnormalities and malformations. And those are probably words that you've heard. And... Um, think maybe she popped out. <laughs> so we'll wait a minute and see if she's going to join us. There you I'm go. back. I told you I'd be back. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, I detest those words. I was talking about those words that we've probably heard. If you're listening in and watching tonight and you've experienced miscarriage or infant loss, and, um, and we know those are children. Those are our precious babies, our sons or daughters. And so that's how I want to talk about them tonight. Um, some of you may be here and you're, you've experienced miscarriage uh, maybe multiple times or you have no living children on this earth. And I want you to know right now, you are a mother. You are a mommy, just like anybody else. And you have a child. Um, and he or she is already home. And we want to share the hope with you um, that makes that possible tonight. Now during my pregnancy we were faced with two options after we received that news. We could um, continue the pregnancy knowing that she would die or we could um, terminate the pregnancy. And you know we, we were very far from the Lord at that time but with certain conviction we just couldn't leave that office um, without telling the doctors right up front we are going to continue this pregnancy and we will let God call our baby home when it's time. Um, you know we didn't quite understand what all of that meant at the time but all we knew is we loved our daughter and we couldn't make that decision and so we carried her for another 12 weeks before um, I went into premature labor and she was born and she lived for 45 minutes and each of those minutes she was cradled in our arms and just held by her dad and I and um, we just were a mommy and a daddy to her for as long as we could be. 
And all the while, during that pregnancy, after knowing the diagnosis, um, God was just doing some amazing things in my heart and in my life. Even though I had um, trusted Christ as my Savior as a teenager, I was so far from Him. I was not walking with the Lord. My husband didn't know the Lord at all. And um, this was a time where I, I felt like I couldn't do anything but turn to Him. And He was so faithful. He was a God who had never let me go. And He was waiting there with open arms, you know, just says, is the case that with the story of the prodigal son I had gone running back to him and and he was so faithful to reveal his promises to me and so um, as I think about that time and I think about just being in the trenches of our grief one of the verses that has really spoke to me is from from Psalm 119 verse 50 and it says this my comfort in my suffering is this your promise preserves my life and truly it was the promises of God that preserved my life, that gave me hope and strength and the ability to get up in the morning and to do the things I needed to do and to take care of myself and to be a mom to my son who was living and to be a wife. Um, that, was, that was all I could rely upon. And um, I'm so thankful for that. You know, and for, it would have been four months after Chloe died, um, as God was just working in my heart and, and through me, and as I was being an example to my husband of that after Chloe died, my husband came to know the Lord as his personal Savior. And it was truly the greatest joy um, to be able to pray with him and to, to just tears flowing and for him to give his life to Christ. And I knew what that meant for us. I knew that that meant eternity. And I knew that that meant uh, being reunited and what hope. And, you know, I wish I could say that everything has been perfect since then, but it hasn't. You know, we did go on to have a, another child and we had a little girl. And I'll tell you, it's frustrating when you're pregnant and um, after a loss and people are are making comments like, oh, that's so good. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Because it's as if that child's a replacement, and that's just not possible. Um, they're all our children. And so we, we did become pregnant. We have a healthy four-year-old little girl who we love to pieces, and um, yet she's a different child you know, than Chloe. They're separate children. And then in 2009, um, just feeling confident that the Lord wanted us to continue to grow our family, we experienced two more miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And one was an early gestation miscarriage at six weeks along uh, to a baby whom we named Jesse. And uh, we got pregnant again right away afterwards and carried that baby for 14 weeks. And we ended up miscarrying her right at the beginning of our second trimester, a little girl who we named Raya May. And um, what I recall about uh, that that's just very precious to me um, in her story is that, um, quite honestly, even though I had experienced two losses prior, I wasn't um, phased by it. I, I had this confidence that everything would be okay. And I went in for my regular appointment. They couldn't find the heartbeat with the Doppler wand, which wasn't totally uncommon because uh, the, the clinic I went to did ultrasounds all the time. And so my nurse practitioner, she said, you know what, we'll just pop you in for an ultrasound and we'll just make sure everything's okay. I'm sure it's fine. And I, I believed it as well. Well, in that minute or two that I had in the um, doctor's office as I was waiting for the sonographer, I, I thought, you know, something might be wrong. And, and I just took that opportunity to pray. And I said, God, I don't know uh, what I'm going to find out, but whatever it is, I'll still love you. I will still love you. And I just kept repeating that. And I went into the ultrasound room and knew the sonographer by name. We had become friends. And um, within seconds of bringing the images up on the screen, she said, I'm so sorry. There's no heartbeat. And I burst into tears. And I managed to muffle out these words. I said, when I was in there waiting, I prayed. And I said, God, 
whatever happens, I still love you, and I'm still going to serve you, and you are still my God. And I meant it then, and I mean it now, and I, and I hope that that resonates with you tonight, that if you're here listening and you're wondering, where are you, God? I want you to know that he is still seated on the throne. He still reigns, and he is still the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he holds your precious baby in his arms, and he loves you so much. Um, now, all along the way, our ministry, Mommies with Hope, had been growing, and, and I knew that we needed something. We needed a resource, a tool for the women that, that I was ministering to. And I love writing, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to write a book, and if it gets published for the mass, is great, but if I, I'm still going to write it for this group of women in Iowa that I meet with, no matter what. And so... Um, I parked myself in God's promises for quite a while, and that's what the book is about. It offers hope for today, scripture verses that we can memorize and that can encourage us and that we can live out, as well as promises for tomorrow, because these promises, um, they're vast and many and countless in scripture. Um, but there are just ten that I, that I address in the book, starting with, Jesus, the ultimate promise. You know, we, we must know Jesus and his love for us and that he laid down his life for us um, and that he is our life preserver. Because here's the thing, ladies. God wants us to live. He wants us to fully live. He doesn't want us to just merely exist in this world, but he wants us to live and to give us an abundant life in Christ. And I want that for each of you. Some of the other promises that I talk about in the book are about God's love. Um, obviously, that goes right with um, Jesus. But His love, do you know that you are beloved of God? Do you know that in Scripture, it talks about you being the apple of His eye? How precious is that? And His goodness, the promise of God's goodness. Yes, babies die. Women are abused. Children are abused. Um, women are put in desperate situations um, and just hurting from life circumstances. And there's chaos all throughout this world. But God is still good because his character is good. He's a, he ha, his character is loving and merciful, and yet he's just. And so uh, we can trust in that and we can trust in his goodness. And also promises of his peace and restoration and refinement. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is from 1 Peter 1 that talks about having a living hope through Jesus Christ and how we have this faith that's refined by the fire. Even though we suffer grief and all kinds of trials for a little while, they have come so that we can be refined. And so I pray that for each of you tonight, whether you're here because of abortion or miscarriage or infant loss or abuse, I want you to know that this is a safe place, a place where there's hope, and a place where refining can take place because of Jesus. Thank you. Now at this time, I want to introduce my friend Dawn Scott Jones, and she is the author of When a Woman You Love Was Abused. Thank you, Teske. And I just have to say what a powerful testimony that you share with us tonight of God's redeeming love and his message for your life and also for Kim thank you so much for sharing your story I have a story too and um, it's not a fun one to share but I'm so thankful for God's healing in my life as well as I shared with you earlier I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse uh, my story is not uncommon. My perpetrator was a trusted family member, someone who everyone looked up to, was my father. My dad was my hero, my hero by day, but one night he became the predator, a monster, and he began to sexually molest me I think when I was about 10 or 11, you know, sometimes a traumatic event is so amazing that your mind just doesn't want to retain it. So I don't have the memory of the first time, but I have many memories and without any doubt know that I survived. I never knew when I was going to go to bed at night whether I was going to be safe 
or whether I was going to struggle. When I was 19 years old, I finally was going to get out of the house. And I met someone who had long brown curly hair and a big flashy smile, and I figured must be love. So let's get married. That was a great decision. And uh, so I got out of the house, and I thought, like so many women do, that it's over now. You know, it's in my past. And I'm going to just have a fresh start. I'm just going to get away from it all. After all, you know, I'm a Christian and I have forgiven my dad and it's just going to quietly fade away. Uh, doesn't sin just go into the sea of forgetfulness and sink? But I discovered that emotional wounds don't sink. You know, they come right back to you. And I started struggling with symptoms the aftermath of abuse. You know, I say that I was a Christian, but I have to tell you, I was so angry. I was so angry at God. I was angry at everybody and everything, and I can remember shaking my fist at heaven and saying, what kind of God are you? Where were you when I was weeping? Where were you when I was crying? There was no answer at that time that would soothe my heart. And so I went into my marriage very angry. Uh, I carried that residue of the abuse for years. You know, I really had no idea that what happened to me when I was 10, 11, 12, that, that I would struggle at 30, 35, that it would still haunt me years later. And I had to admit that um, I was really broken. I was really hurting. Maybe you understand that. Maybe you too have experienced something and you're not sure if there's healing. You don't even know if hope and healing is possible. And I want to tell you tonight that it is. You know, sometimes we want to minimize what I, I didn't want to admit that I was as broken as I was. I didn't want to look at the pain. I really thought, in fact, if I were to look at it, if I were to face my past, that I was going to fall into a black hole of emotional, mental illness, in fact. I thought I, I would unravel completely, that I would maybe go crazy. That's how deep the pain was. That's how massive it was in my life. And um, so I didn't want to look at my past. I, um, I fought it for a long time. And I'd like to tell you that... Um, I faced my healing, but not because I chose to, not because I was brave, not because I thought it's time. I faced it because I had a, a crash, an emotional crash. I'll tell you about that in a moment, but maybe this is a good time just to share with you some facts about sexual abuse. Um, you know, there are three basic categories of sexual abuse. And I want to share these with you because there may be someone tonight that you're confused or maybe you think, you know, that much didn't happen to me. I kind of remember, but you have all of these symptoms and all of these issues and you're shaming yourself for feeling what you're feeling. Let me, let me talk to you about that just for a minute because no matter what form of abuse you suffered, sexual abuse leaves its mark. There's three basic categories. One is touching, non-touching, and the third is exploitation. Touching includes molesting, fondling, and penetration. Non-touching, voyeurism, sexual acts in front of a child, talking about a child's sexual um, body parts, mocking, those kinds of things, and exploitation, photos, taking photos of the child, using the child in pornography, selling the child, uh, certainly in sex trafficking. Uh, you might wonder why you're struggling the way you are. You might feel embarrassed. I want to release you from shame. Sexual abuse is a devastating, horrific, violation against the heart of a child. It not only molests your body, but it molests your soul as well. 
after I got married and started having my children, I have two daughters and a son, and after I had my daughters, I began to struggle. I told you a moment ago that I had to face my healing because I had a crash. When my daughter turned about the age that I believe I was when sexual abuse started, I crashed. I woke up one morning and up until that morning I had done pretty good at staying ahead of that emotional steamroller that was chasing me down. I had done pretty good at keeping myself busy and staying active. I was active in my church. I was singing and I was teaching Bible study and I never planned on talking about sexual abuse the rest of my life. But one morning I woke up and everything was different. Everything felt wrong and I slipped into the deepest, darkest depression that I had ever experienced panic attacks, anxiety. I didn't know what was wrong with me and I would wake up that way for another 164 mornings in a row. I went to the doctor and I said just give me something I want it to go away and after a while he said to me I think you might have some issues that you have to deal with. I gotta be honest with you that made me so mad. I thought of course I have issues. Everybody has issues. I married issues and I birthed issues and you're an issue. Just give me something. But I, I had to look at my past. I had to be willing to take that healing journey and so I started the process. And the Lord was faithful to meet me there. In fact, do you know that 80 percent of us as survivors will experience one psychological episode in their life. We will have panic attacks, eating disorders, complete shame. Shame, by the way, is not just episodes of shame, but an identity of shame. How about body armor? There are women who eat for comfort or eat to protect themselves. They figure if, if I eat enough and gain enough weight, nobody will ever touch me again. Suicidal thoughts, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, fears and phobias, so many things. The aftermath is horrific. I started to trust God in a way that I never had before and now it was a matter of survival. The healing power of Jesus Christ is amazing and he brought me to scriptures like Isaiah 61 verse 3 where he said he would take the ashes and make my life beautiful. Ecclesiastes 3 11 where God makes all things beautiful in his time. Philippians 1 6 that he who began a good work in me would be faithful to complete it. By the way those are scriptures that are available to you. Their promises to you. you know, when I looked at my life, I felt like I was damaged goods. I was broken. I was flawed. I was a terrible wife. I could not experience intimacy. I had fear. I was walled off. I didn't know how I would ever break through. But God, God in His grace met me in my broken place and he began to speak truth to me and life to me. Teske, you mentioned the verse a moment ago that we are accepted in the beloved. God showed me that I was accepted and I was. But because he loved me so much, he wasn't going to leave me just as I was. He was going to bring me to wholeness. Uh, I was married for 27 years and if you've been married for 27 minutes, you know that marriage takes focus and commitment and intentionality. And my marriage struggled. We struggled for years. We struggled in intimacy. We struggled in trust. We struggled in control issues. We had a friendship, but we were never able to grasp the marriage that God wanted us to have. I did have a breakthrough and healing began, but unfortunately it was too late for the marriage and I experienced a painful divorce. I believe that much of that was rooted 
in the childhood abuse. Friend, if you're going through difficulty in your life and in your marriage, you know, sometimes we want that, that beautiful ending, but we don't want to travel the journey to get there. God's got healing for you. And no matter where you are, it's never too late. The Lord is faithful. And that's what tonight's about. He wants to redeem your life. So those are our stories. They're real and they're raw. And we praise God that He is real and He is faithful and He is present. So now we're going to take some questions and um, we're going to hear from you. So we're going to go, Kim, did you have a comment? I see you talking. Do you have something you want to add? Unmute your mic. Um, just as I was listening to you, I had started by saying that the common thread in our stories was loss. But truly, as I've listened to both of you, and I know your stories somewhat, you know, I mean, we've been becoming friends. Um, our common, the common thread is the love of Christ. It's the love of Jesus Christ. All of the same verses that you two have spoken tonight have also sustained me. Um, he does make everything beautiful in his time. And I remember when I encountered that scripture, and I thought, Lord, how will you possibly bring beauty out of this devastation and the destruction that I felt I had wrought? And yet he's done it. And part of how he has done that, and I want to say this to you if you've had an abortion, is to help me love my child even in death. To know that my child lives on in heaven, that's not in question. God has been so faithful and merciful to receive the children that we rejected and that we were ignorant toward um, in our ignorance. But the child that, that I lost has a ministry because he's helped me proclaim the truth that life begins before birth. He's helped me proclaim the truth that we're parents, as Chesky said, of deceased children. It's not that we're not parents. But God's love can be that bridge of heavenly hope. So um, the same verses that are being proclaimed, God's word is all sufficient for whatever our issues are tonight. And just as I've been monitoring the chat, you know, the questions that are out there and some of the life circumstances that have been um, just hinted at, uh, wow, I mean, your, your, your stories are as dramatic and as difficult as ours, but God, mm -hmm. but God is the common thread, the love of Christ to heal us and sustain us. That's right, and it, Beth has a question for me. She says, you've lost three babies. How do you remember and honor each of your children without getting overwhelmed with grief and sadness and you know that's a great question Beth because I think oftentimes people um, especially those around us they think well if we do something to honor and to remember then it's just going to be harder for us um, like we have the holidays just around the corner and um, if this is a first holiday for some of you or maybe it's the second third or tenth holiday um, and you can speak from experience people do not want to say the name and it's like the awkward elephant in the room. And one of the ways that I like to honor each of my babies any time of the year is by speaking their name. You probably noticed um, in my story that I shared each of their names, Chloe, Jesse, and Raya May, because I did choose to name those babies. Now sometimes women who experience miscarriage, they don't choose a name and that's okay too. You know, they may have a, a little name like baby so-and-so or, or whatever little nickname you had for your baby, use that. Um, other ways that we can honor and um, show meaning and significance for their lives is by remembering um, due dates and um, anniversary dates and birth dates or would-be birth dates. Um, those are days that I like to reach out to other women that have experienced loss and maybe send a card or um, flowers or just send them a note that I'm thinking of them. But I think unfortunately it starts with us 
as the moms and as the parents. Um, we're kind of the, the gauge for other people around us to know that, hey, you know, we want to talk about it. We want to honor our children. We want to do something special. And it could be any number of things. I mean, it could be a balloon release. It could be um, those Chinese lanterns um, that go off in the air. I know of people who've done that. Um, if you can see behind me, I have a curio shelf. Um, and this shelf actually uh, we bought especially to house all of the mementos that we have um, for each of our babies who have died. And so there are um, handprints and footprints and pictures. And you may not have some of those things, I understand that, but you can create them. You can do something now, even if it's years later, um, if it's putting together a, a book with some special Bible verses or scriptures. But just choose to do something. Um, if that's stirring in your mind and in your heart, I do think it will be helpful. Um, because when a, when a baby dies, um, what happens is we don't have the memories and we don't have the tangible kinds of things that we do when an older person dies and those are the things that help us cope with our grief and so by doing things and creating things it's really helping us as we cope with our grief I have a question here someone wants to know how did you move past being a victim and another question said did prayer have a part of your healing so I'm gonna blend those two together because that's how I moved past being a victim, <laughs> prayer. But first of all, it started with a determination. I, I just believed that God's word was true. And once I grabbed onto that, I started to see all the promises that God's word had for me, me, Dawn. I didn't want to live as a victim. I didn't want to be stuck in the pain of the past. I believed that God had a glorious future for me. If you really can take ashes and give beauty, I cried out to God and I said, I want that beauty, Lord. I want the full life that you have for me. I prayed to God and I talked to him. You know, there wasn't a lot to prayer at first because I was so angry, but that was one of my first prayers. Lord, I'm angry at you. Where were you? And you know, God just began to show me that that he was there the same place for me as he was when his son Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was loving me and holding me and he was going to resurrect my life and make something beautiful out of it. That's just what worked for me. But I have to tell you the power of the Holy Spirit is very real. And he began to peel off of me that shame identity. I told you a moment ago shame guilt is when you've done something wrong but shame is when you say I am something wrong and so God began to peel that off of me and he used the power of his word speak my word and I just started quoting and claiming and confessing God's word over my mind and over my life and he transformed me Corinthians first Corinthians 517 if anyone be in Christ they are a brand new creation. Brand new. I was that little caterpillar that went into the cocoon and thought for sure life was over when I was in depression and anxiety. But God opened it up in his time and released. And I feel like a butterfly, like give me a new, a new life. Don't be a victim. Your dreams have to be bigger than your memories. God's got greatness in store for you. Don't settle. Hmm. Oh, it's so inspiring to listen to my sisters, Dawn and Teske. I have a question, um, and, and some of them are you know, shorter than longer, so I'll, I'll also answer a few at once here. Uh, the most healing scripture for me was 1 John 1, 9, which a friend spoke into my life uh, when I was struggling after the divorce of my first marriage. And she said, Kim, Jesus loves you, and if you confess your sin, he's faithful to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. She said he did this because he loves you, and if you were the only one here, he would have come to do this for you. And somehow her love for me helped me really believe it, that Christ's sacrifice was for me. And I want you to know, I want to echo something that Don just said. I started looking into who Christ is, 
which helped me get my eyes off my problems. And at that time, they were many. The abortion was long buried, but they were many problems. And But I started to ponder, what must Christ's love be like if he would just forgive me? Because I knew I didn't deserve that. And so as his love became more real in my life, I began to hunger for the word. And please don't think that we're just preaching this at you tonight. The word has changed my life. The word will change your life if you will let it. We're not trying to just brush you off and say, go read your Bible. The Word has changed my life. Part of the reason why I decided to tell my story, a couple of women have asked that question in the chat, is because when Christ unveiled the meaning of the cross to me, that the condition of my heart is what required Him to sacrifice so that I could be forgiven. I was so stricken with um, repentance, the mm. gift of repentance, that I was willing to do anything that he asked me to do. And he did ask me to go and tell the meaning of the cross, that it's his love. He said, tell them I love them. I felt that in my spirit, Christ was saying, I'm so glad you finally get it, Kim. Go tell them I love them. And so I don't recommend that everybody go public with a story about an abortion. I think it's important you tell someone. I think it's very important that you pray and ask God to help you identify a safe person. And I'm going to tell you, I believe the healing happens within the body of Christ in the church. I was very terrified that after I had come to faith and now was trying to walk out a Christian life or what it, I thought that should look like in my mind, I thought people would condemn me at church if they knew what I had done or who I had been. But that was just my ignorance. And if people do condemn me and they don't understand God's mercy in my life, well, I feel sorry for them. I'm not afraid of them. I feel sorry for them because my life verse is Luke 7, 47, the one forgiven much loves much. <laughs> and Christ understands. Christ understands where I've been. And you know, the only reason I share my story really is because um, I, I want to share just enough so you know how far Christ had to go to bring me back into the light of his love. Mm -hmm. So I do recommend that you share your story with someone who can help you understand. And the next big question was, where do we go for help? Is it professional counseling? Uh, what, what, what's the first step? And I would highly recommend that you would go to a post-abortion Bible study that's offered in the Pregnancy Help Centers through the Pregnancy Help Movement. It's a very surprising place to think about help where they're trying to rescue babies from abortion, vulnerable women's um, decisions and choices for abortion. But that's where the loving uh, mercy of Christ became real to me in a post-abortion ministry. And you can, you can find the resources in my book. You can find them online, and you can get them uh, at my website at cradlemyheart.org and get your healing started tonight and get, get connected with somebody who knows the issues and can help you in an effective way. Uh, but you've got to start. You've got to tell somebody sometime. Why not now? Why not let your healing begin within the safety of a Christian community? Mm -hmm. That's good. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Kim. And, you know, as you were speaking and talking about um, just our sin and, and Jesus coming down to rescue us, I was thinking of the verse that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yet while we were still sinners and and I think about that, and I think about each of us, and we have different stories and, and different baggage, but our sin looks the same to God. Mm -hmm. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's all of us. And I, and I bet that there are um, some here who are wondering, well, you know, how do, how do these stories go together? And you said it so well in that we, the common thread is Jesus Christ. We all need redemption, no matter what our story is. And so I appreciate that so much. Um, there was a question that came in that I that I want to address, and I want to just pray over um, this woman here. She um, just so vulnerably shared that she has seven wonderful children. Um, what what a blessing! And yet she has recently experienced her first miscarriage at six weeks. And um, if you're if you're watching and listening, I'm so sorry. And I, I just want to have a moment of prayer for you, and then I want to address the question that she asked. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
We don't understand why these things happen, but we know we can trust you. We thank you so much for this precious, tiny life um, that means so much to his mom and his dad. Um, and Lord, we just pray that um, through this, um, something would be um, just known or made known to reveal your glory. Um, Lord, I pray your hand of comfort and your loving embrace on this family um, for the, the siblings who are expecting a, another little one in their home and for the parents who have um, just opened their hearts to uh, raising these children for you, Lord, on this earth. Just lift this family up to you tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. And this woman, she's, she's saying how so much she wants to have another child but the thought of that is just very scary and and how do you juggle that um, balance that of a desire for more children yet the fear and the anxiety of of another pregnancy that could potentially end in miscarriage and um, she says she knows it's an issue of trusting God and that ultimately it's up to him because you're right he is the creator um, and so what thoughts or biblical insight might I have as I think about that scenario and it's one that I um, deal with a lot in the ministry that I do I think about uh, one of my favorite verses on peace which is from Isaiah 26 verse 3 and it says you keep in perfect peace mm -hmm. him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you and it is such a matter of trusting God and I just pray that um, that would be a reality in your life and that you would have a peace that surpasses understanding and trusting in him and what does that look like practically well you know on a practical level it might look like um, moment moment by moment minute by minute hour by hour whatever it is just handing that over to the Lord and saying, Lord, right now I, I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm dealing with whatever those emotions are. Those emotions are not bad. God created us with feelings and emotions to experience life, but give those over to him if you're not comfortable with them. Um, and just you know, bombard the throne of grace with prayer um, would be one just very practical thing um, that I would suggest. And, you know, if you're not sure in that decision about trying again or not, um, you know, you need to be unified with your husband or your, your partner on that and so that you are making those decisions um, united and after bathing it completely in prayer. Um, you know, I think also of the importance of finding others that you can share with because you're still you still have that grief and that's always going to be a part of you and so like Kim was saying you know finding others to share your story with um, you know connecting even if it's um, through some sort of online ministry or with other women in your church or your community um, no doubt there are um, many many women who've experienced loss that long to share their stories but they just have never maybe had that opportunity. And so uh, be bold, uh, be open, be willing to have an open heart and to share that so that you can have others come alongside you and share in your comfort and your sufferings. Thank you, Teske. There's a lot of questions coming in that are asking about getting professional help. Let me address that and then maybe the others have a, an answer as well. Yes. I believe it's critical to go to someone who specializes, at least I will speak for sexual abuse. There are many pastors who love you as a sheep, there are friends, there are mentors, but this is one area where you're going to want to seek a Christian counselor who is a professional who understands the nuances, the triggers, memories, flashbacks, the pain, the depth of it. I really recommend that for you. And um, I know another question had come in asking about me being a pastor. Did I become a pastor after my healing? Yes, but I'm still healing. <laughs> um, it's a journey and it's a process. But there's a season where you really focus in on your healing in this arena. And I would recommend that you do seek a professional for that. Just one other question that came in. The, the question is, why did I decide to tell my husband about my sexual abuse and should, 
should we tell? I believe disclosure is absolutely imperative. I told him before we were ever married. The problem was I didn't realize how pervasive the wound was. I told him I had been abused by my dad about as casually as I told him what I wanted on my pizza and what my favorite television show was. It just I didn't understand. And so because I shared it casually, he took it casually. Later on when we started having trouble, I realized how involved it was, how complicated, how deeply scarred I was. But he had a difficulty grasping the truth of that and the and the enormity of it. Again, professional counseling, if we would have done that as a couple, we might have had a different story. A different ending so I really recommend that for you Kim I want to I want to address that question and I do deal with this in my book um, the American Psychological Association has officially declared that there is no mental health crisis for women after abortion and you know I I put this in the context of the story of the bleeding woman in the Bible and it says she had spent all of her money and all of her time on doctors but still she wasn't well because that really reflects the path that I took I had a lot of faith in secular counseling uh, I didn't necessarily go asking for help with the abortion issue but when other things would happen in my life as I mentioned a divorce or the death of a family member that caused really strong overt grief um, I would mention in my history that I had an abortion in my past and it was glossed over there was no emphasis, there was no help to connect the dots that I had this unresolved grief issue over having lost a pregnancy and the unresolved guilt of having uh, had a hand in that. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't addressed. Um, the American Psychological Association I think has a stake in abortion politics and I think that accounts for the stand that they've taken. But I think you have to be very careful and very discerning if you're going to go for professional counseling. Now, there are uh, connections that have been made with eating disorders, with addiction, with promiscuity, with, all, with divorce, with impaired relationships, with impaired parenting, and counseling can absolutely help you with your relationships and with your life issues. But to resolve the grief and the guilt that come through abortion, I, I have not experienced that professional counseling for the issue, as Dawn said, you know, I've not, I've not seen a, a specialty among professional counselors unless they are Christian counselors. And as I understand, there is, through the American Association of Christian Counselors, a new curriculum that is going to be available soon for this. So uh, I believe the medical community is catching up. But my approach is that it's primarily a spiritual problem anyway, and so that's not what they're called to do. They're not called to help us answer questions about God. And what I really found after all those long years of struggle is that when the spiritual issues were resolved my emotions came in line mm -hmm. that's so good I, when my when my spirit was healed my emotions were able to operate properly and so I want to encourage you that it can seem like well I should get counseling that would put structure on this uh, and and if it's for these collateral issues that I've mentioned, then I think that, yes, that can be beneficial. Uh, for the abortion itself, I can't really recommend it just because of what I know about where the counseling community stands um, on the problem. And one other question that I had on email was, how, was it hard to overcome a fear of going public with my story? You know, I was working in news radio in Minneapolis at the time on the big news talk station. I had my own talk show. And um, after I was redeemed, you know, they pay you to have an opinion and talk radio. And after I was redeemed, I reported to work when my new opinion was, Jesus is Lord. And that wasn't quite as popular an opinion as some of the political stands that I had taken or <laughs> other, other topics that we dealt with. Um, but, you know, I allowed God to lead me where he wanted me to go with it. In the beginning, yes, it was very fearful. I thought, certainly people would reject me because I didn't understand how commonplace abortion is and I thought that I was a monster because I had, you know, as I said, had a hand in destroying the life of the child. So in answering God's call to share my story and share his story in my life, I decided that I would allow Christ to be my role model 
Because in Philippians it says, for God's sake, he made himself of no reputation. And I decided that I was done with the reputation that I had built for myself over the life of my child, that the price that I had paid had led to the fact that I had had no peace in that career. So if God wanted to dismantle it, maybe it would be the greatest relief of my life. And that helped me through the fear short term. But I want you to know that the reception that I got from the church and from God's people and from the pro-life community was outstanding. It was an outstanding, warm, beautiful welcome. And I've never regretted, I've never regretted it for a minute. Thank you for sharing that, Kim. I wanted to address a question that um, has come in multiple times about how if, if you have a friend or a family member or if you encounter someone who has experienced a miscarriage or an infant loss, a stillbirth, how can you help them? What are some practical things to say or to do? And um, right off the bat, I just want to say um, if you don't know what to say, at least say you're sorry. Say, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, not saying anything will be to your detriment because not saying anything uh, sends the message that either A, you don't care, or B, my child's life was not important enough to be acknowledged. Um, and that may not be your intent whatsoever. Um, and if you have experienced some of those things as someone who has had a loss, that probably is not the intent of those well-meaning loved ones who maybe didn't say anything or said something really stupid. We could have a whole webcast about that, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, just say you're sorry. You know, another way that you can very practically um, come alongside someone and encourage them is to send a note on what would have been the due date, if you know that, or around the time of year when they would have been due. Um, you could... Um, one thing I've known other people to do is maybe get get a gift um, at Christmas time or on what would have been a birthday or something like that and donate it to an organization or charity or the hospital. Um, there are some very practical things that we can do just to show that we care, um, that we're still remembering that person and what they've been through and that we love them because one of the, the toughest things for a uh, couple who has experienced loss is that you get you get stuck in your grief you're stuck there and you're just numb and you're shocked you're in shock and the rest of the world seems to be moving on and that is so hard that's a hard place to be um, and so if you're one of those people on the outside if you can reach back and let that person know that you're still thinking of them whether it be a card flowers a meal um, some sort of keepsake or memento um, then go ahead and do that that is really a wonderful gift and that's why my shelf behind me is so full because many of those things were given to us and we treasure those things. Another question that has come in is one that I get asked a lot. How did you forgive your abuser? How did you forgive your dad? You know, thanks Kim for some of your comments. They're really critical to understand that there are spiritual matters involved in the healing process. In fact, m most of it is a spiritual thing. And forgiveness is one of those keys. We can do all the counseling and we can understand and we can have the medication if needed, but unless we're willing to take that next step of forgiveness, we're going to stay, stay trapped in our pain and trapped in, in the victim mindset. So forgiveness was very important and in fact we know that the word talks about forgiveness God's word directs us to do that quick quick few points on forgiveness forgiveness is an act of our will it isn't a feeling so I don't have to feel like I want to forgive or feel like I've forgiven forgiveness is something that I choose to do first and then it's a process I forgave many times. I made the, for, the decision to forgive my dad, but as I was going through my healing, I had to forgive over and over and over again, each time a little bit more, a, a deeper level, till it finally came from my heart. And it doesn't mean that we forget. It doesn't mean that it was okay. 
forgiveness doesn't mean that we should have a relationship again. That will be up to you. Forgiveness does mean that we release that person who hurt us. We let them go. We give up our right to hurt them for hurting us. Forgiveness is very, very important and very freeing when you get to the place where you forgive they no longer have power over you you have taken back the reins and the control and uh, it's the beginning of healing it was for me Kim? I, I really want to echo what you're saying there because I think that you know as I walked out of the abortion and saw my former fiance sitting there there was just a bitterness that flooded my heart because I blamed him 100%. You know, we were engaged, and I thought when I learned I was pregnant that he would marry me. I, of course, we'll just get married. And um, I had just started, you know, it was my dream at 23 to have this radio job. I had my own program in a major market, and I had, I had quit college a couple of years earlier. I didn't even flunk out. I was just mediocre and walked away. So now this was my chance my redemption, I thought, uh, starting this career. And there was no way in 1978 I was going to be a single mother. Uh, plus, you know, I had school debt and everything else. And um, so there he sat, and I was so bitter. And I thought, I just, you know, I want nothing to do with you. I was mortified that I had trusted him, and I blamed him 100% for what had occurred. But uh, later, when I became a Christian, I realized that... Um, you know, we were, we were sexually active outside of marriage. That contributed to my guilt and shame. Um, he wasn't to blame for that. Uh, you know, there were people who should have been present in my life who were emotionally absent and not supportive of me. He wasn't to blame for that. Uh, there, were many th there were many people I could have blamed, including the people at the abortion facility who lied to me, who regularly lied to accomplish their business practices. Um, Blame is just a dead end, and it is spiritually crippling. Rick Warren said, the way to spell blame is be lame. <laughs> and I mean, as God allowed me to forgive him, I agree with Don. That's when my healing really began, or maybe it was the fruit of healing. You know, they, they, they're so um, intertwined, the forgiveness and our healing that it's hard to say, you know, how the process actually unfolded. But I can tell you, I have forgiven him 100%. I, um, when I forgave him, and this is still very tender to me, but when I forgave him, I, I sought counsel from a friend, and I said, you know, do, I, do you think I need to get in touch with him? Because he had tried to ask me to forgive him in the short term, and uh, he sent a mutual friend, and I told her if she ever mentioned his name again, that our friendship was over. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but years later, when God had tendered my heart and I had forgiven him, I, I sought a wise friend and I said, do you think that I need to let him know that I have forgiven him? And we prayed and she said, I don't. You're married now. Who knows where his situation is in life? If God wants you to have that opportunity, you can pray that God will bring that about. And you can pray for his peace and for his salvation for, and for his relationship with God. And I did that. And God has given me to know, and I can't really tell you the details of how this has happened, but God has given me to know that he understands that I have forgiven him and that he has heard the message that God has forgiven him. And that is just one way that God has brought something beautiful out of our story. Because um, it, it, I didn't have to interfere with my marriage and dishonor my husband by you know, renewing a tie with someone from before my husband and I even knew each other. Uh, but God is working it all out. And forgiveness is at the very heart of what God wants for you after abortion, after abuse, after miscarriage. Forgiveness is at the very heart of what God wants for us. Thank you for sharing that, Kim. I know that's, that's such a tender place for you to go. And um, we all have those tender places, that's for sure. And um, you know, Don and Kim, you've both talked about um, bitterness, and that's one of the questions that has come through. And so I want to address that because some of the women are asking, well, how do we not become, you know, how do we keep ourselves from becoming bitter? And as I was thinking about that question, I was 
um, just prompted to pull out my Bible and um, and go to Psalm 73 and I just want to read a few verses from Psalm 73 that I think speak to this so well and let's see I'll start at um, verse 21 it says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Forgive me, Lord, my goodness, because I have been that way many times. And then um, verse 23 goes on to say, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And after afterward, you will take me in to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And this is a passage that has just really, um, God has just used in my life in dealing with bitterness. Because, you know, when you go through trials and when um, people hurt you or um, you just don't understand you know why me why me why me the the person who you know can take care of my children and and yet there's a woman over here whose baby died or baby lived and she did drugs her whole pregnancy I mean those are the questions I've asked um, why me and it's okay to ask those why me questions God wants us to pour our hearts out to him and he always has that listening ear available to us um, but it's what we do with that because I th I've found for me when I have gotten stuck in a rut of those why questions over and over um, when I know what his truth says about those things that he is a loving God he's merciful his character is is um, is loving and that he has a future and a hope for me um, yet there is sin in the world you know but when I get stuck in those ruts and I get into this this um, it really gives root to bitterness I can remember that God is there to hold me by my right hand to take me into glory my heart and my flesh fail but the Word of God stands forever and I can trust in that and so um, it really comes down to for me taking captive those thoughts that I think lead to bitterness in my heart and making them obedient to Christ and so trying to turn those complaints if you will into um, praises of Thanksgiving has been a practical way that I've been able to ward off bitterness Thank you. I know that our time is going, and I'm just going to answer one quick question, then I'm going to toss it to you, Kim. Uh, someone did ask, and we talked about forgiveness. How did I forgive my father? What were the steps that I took? And I just want to touch on that one more time, because I feel the Holy Spirit is on this. My dad called me and asked if he could talk to me, and he came over that day, and my heart was hard and it was bitter but I will tell you that as I said before I chose to forgive my father and he said this one statement to me I don't want to die a lonely old man my dad was only 60 when he said that but at 62 he contracted cancer for nine months I took care of him with my sisters we sat around his bedside I put lotion on the hands that reached out to abuse me I took care of the father who had harmed me and I knew in that moment that the forgiveness had been done it was a miracle of God and you know when my dad died he didn't die a lonely old man he died with his family all around him all of us had forgiven him and released it I want to encourage you tonight there is no mountain too big there is no root of bitterness so strong God can do amazing things with a willing, broken heart. Give it to Him. Turn it loose and you'll find freedom. Kim? Well, I think that we're, our time is just about up. And I want to thank everybody for your participation tonight, for sending us your questions and for staying with us and um, for joining us for Women Redeemed 2.0. We've had some great questions. And uh, as, we, as we think about wrapping up tonight, um, if you have something else that you need or want to share, Don and Teske and I want to invite you to join us uh, back on our own Facebook pages and also um, on Twitter or to keep the conversation going. So I'm just going to go point by point of how you can find us. And Teske, let's start with you. Uh, Teske, give us all of your, um, uh, your bona fides, uh, how to find you online, Twitter, Facebook, etc. 
Absolutely. I would love it if you guys would seek me out. You can um, find me on Facebook at just facebook.com backslash Teske Drake. And you can also like my Mommies with Hope ministry page on Facebook and just search for Mommies with Hope. And visit me at my website, www.mommieswithhope.com. This month is actually National Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. So I have a special series running um, that where I'm detailing a promise of God every single day giveaways and whatnot so go ahead and check me out there you're on Twitter too aren't you Teske yes I am on Twitter I have two oh. my handle is mommies with hope or Teske Drake so thank you Kim and do you care to give an email address Teske at mommies with hope dot com all right perfect and Dawn how how can uh, folks get in touch with you I'll make it real easy if you go to dawnjones.org, that's dawn, D-A-W-N, jones.org. I have all those little media buttons at the top. And so you can find me by clicking on Twitter or Facebook or my YouTube. You can find me there. Otherwise, my email, dawnj at dawnjones.org. And I would love to connect with you as well. I appreciate both of you so much. I just need to say that, Teske, the clear love that you have for your children, the clear mommy's heart that you have just so comes through. And Dawn, I did visit your um, website recently and saw it, went to your YouTube channel, and uh, you made a statement along the lines that, that you are living without shame, and so people don't have to feel ashamed or embarrassed for you as you tell your story. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just the permission that both of you give us to be real and to be open has just been a real blessing to me tonight. So I appreciate you both a lot. <laughs> and as for me, you also um, can reach me at cradlemyheart.org. That's my blog. And um, you can like me on Facebook there, which takes you to the ministry page, which is facebook.com slash cradlemyheart. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. I'm on Twitter, at Kim Ketola, K-E-T-O-L-A. But the easiest way to find most of it is cradlemyheart.org. And I would love to hear from you um, with an email. You can certainly send me an email at kim at kimketola.com. That one's kind of hard to to catch or write down quickly, but it's also, it's on all my, um, it's on all my, my web material or message me privately on Facebook. I absolutely will maintain your confidence as I know Don and Teske will, and uh, we would all just love to hear from you. Now, don't forget that our books are uh, for sale on Amazon Kindle. You can find us there, and our paperback books are also, of course, on Amazon Kindle. Kriegel Publications has been the sponsor for this webcast, and I know I speak for all of us when I say that we so appreciate the opportunity to bring it to you tonight. Um, and there are, um, you can also check Kriegel's website and Facebook page for more information on our books. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash kriegelbooks, that's K-R-E-G-E-L. And uh, they're also on Twitter, at Kriegel Books, and you can hear about um, more about our books and more about the ministry that uh, Kriegel is helping us to advance. Now, if you don't have a Kindle, don't worry. All of the books are also available at your local Christian bookstore, Google Books, Christian Book Distributors, and other online retailers, and so uh, many libraries, or you can purchase directly from Kriegel, too, and that's simply Kriegel.com, K-R-E-G-E-L, Kriegel.com. Thank you, Teske and Don, for participating. It's been a privilege talking with you tonight and being ministered to uh, by both of you. And thanks for everyone who joined us for our Women Redeemed 2.0. Hopefully we can do this again. We'll see you soon. God bless you. Jesus loves you, and so do I.